So if you want to find the ductility of a material, it can be either in percent elongation, change in length upon the original length, the total change in length. You could do it as percent reduction in area, the total change in area divided by the original area, right? Now let us do a simple example just to give you a little practice. A 0.5 inch diameter round sample of a 1030 carbon steel is pulled to failure in a tensile testing machine. The diameter of the sample was 0.343 inch at the fracture surface. Calculate the percent reduction in area of the sample. So as I always tell you that please pause the lecture here, take your pen and pencil and so on the notebook and solve the question. And the thing again, read it carefully. Take down the data, the known and the unknown, and then solve it. And that's it, right? So pause, do it, make very sure that you are right, and then look at the solution. So this is the problem now. So taking down the data, this is D0, D0, the original diameter. This is DF, the final diameter. The material is 1030 carbon steel, so that is nice to know, but that is all you want to know. And they want to find the percent reduction in area. So you will need to find the initial area and the final area to do this. Now, initial area from here, either get the radius from here and the area is pi r squared or take the diameter as it is and it is pi by 4 d squared, right? So use pi r square or pi by 4 d square and get a naught and a f. And the percent reduction in area is A0 minus AF divided by A0. So just do that calculation and you get the answer. Now, one thing that I want you to note, they have written 53%. I always feel, whether it is the book or anybody else, that this is a bad practice. Always, uh, as engineers and science people, we should give the answer in some values of decimal to be more accurate. So. 53.23, 53.45, some answer like this. So don't round off the decimal answer. Don't round off the decimal answer so much that you give just the whole number. Okay. With that, we come to the end of the tensile test properties. You see, from the tensile test, you get the stress strain diagram. And what are the properties? You find the slope of the line which is the Young's modulus or the elastic modulus. You find the yield strength, which is the end of the elastic region and the beginning of the plastic region. You find the ultimate tensile strength, which is the maximum stress at in the graph. And you find the ductility. At the point of fracture, you find the strain and either write it as a percentage, as percent elongation or find the area at failure. So you find the percent reduction in area, right? So elastic modulus, yield strength, ultimate strength, ductility. These are the four basic major properties. We will do one or two more, but these are the four basic major properties that you get from the tensile test. Now I am just showing you a comparative real graph. This is no schematic. This is a comparative real graph. You have a stress in, of course, kilo psi here and a strain here but just look at the materials variety of materials magnesium structural steel aluminum alloy other aluminum alloy annealed alloy nickel alloy titanium alloy stainless steel another stainless steel nickel alloy steel sae 1340 steel so a large variety of very practical engineering materials and if you see if you go there in the vertical axis, then you can compare the strength, right? The strength, this material is weak. This is a little stronger, a little stronger, more strong, more strong, highly strong, right? So if you go in the strength, in the stress direction, then any curve which is high has a material which is very strong. If you go in the strain direction, then any material which has very big strain, this one or this one is highly ductile. Any material which is here or here is medium ductile. But any material which is only here or only here is much less ductile, right? So in every curve, in every curve, there is a strength of the material and there is a ductility of the material. And in engineering, 
both are very good both are very important you see if you have made a product of this material you will not want it to fail at a low load you will want it to survive and keep on working at very high loads so strength is important a strength is important but if you want to manufacture something manufacturing means plastic deformation you permanently deform the material into a new shape into a new size and so on so ductility is important right so once it is manufactured its strength is important that it should not fail during use but before manufacturing its ductility is also very important because if it is not ductile then it is very difficult to manufacture it as soon as you want to try to change the shape and if it breaks because it was not very ductile right so this is this is it and you can see that sometimes very high strength materials are also ductile sometimes very high strength materials are less ductile sometimes low strength materials are very ductile sometimes low strength material is less ductile so it is no rule it is no rule that if it is lower in strength then it will be very ductile or if it is very high in strength it will be less it is just the nature of the material and that is why the field of material science and engineering is so critical that people have been working on different types of metals and different types of alloys and different types of other materials and they know how to change their properties also they learn how to do that so that if a material is initially strong but not very ductile then can you somehow keep the strength and make it more ductile then it will be better for engineering right so materials have their nature we study more and more materials and we find more and more about it if our material science knowledge is good then we can select a very good material for our particular design for our particular application where the strength is also good where the ductility is also reasonable and where the cost of manufacturing is not too high so that it functions well but we give it to the customers at a reasonable cost otherwise uh, people will not want to buy it okay then now remember when we said that why do we call it engineering stress and engineering strain we told you that we just call it this because there is another type of stress and a strain so this one is called true stress and true strain because this is the real value and in the other one the value was sort of artificial so we had to give it any name they gave it the name of engineering stress and strain. now what should be different we have already discussed it earlier what should be different you see when you do a tensile test when you do a tensile test the length is changing but at the same time the area is also changing isn't it at any new length you find the delta l the change in length right but the area has also changed but what you do it you divide the force by the original cross sectional area so this is rather artificial if you want to know the true value of stress you should divide the current force by the current area the force has increased the area has decreased so you should divide by the current area when you do this you call it true stress when you do it you call it true stress similarly when you find the change in length divided by the current length not the original length right in engineering strain you change the you you take the change in length which is totally correct whatever is the current length minus the original length the change in length so that is very correct but you divide it by the original length so this is again a strain value which is sort of artificial but the true value will be change in length divided by the current length so these values are called then instantaneous values the current values now this is the engineering stress divided by original area engineering strain divided by original length but if you divide by the current or instantaneous one force divided by the current area is true stress true stress and change in length divided by the current length change in length divided by the current length delta l by li that is the true strain right so this is it that there is nothing new here the only thing is that this is very difficult to measure very difficult to measure i told you earlier right when we were doing engineering stress and strain that you see the force is okay because there is a load cell in the machine so as it keeps on applying new force the force is there 
similarly because the cross head is moving or the extensometer is there therefore the change in length is not an issue the change in length is not an issue so therefore the force value is very current the change in length value is very current but the diameter is changing in the lateral direction not in the length direction so unless the machine is equipped with an infrared or a laser type of beam and a calculating system which is very tough then you cannot find the current area and the so on right so so that is the issue therefore we do the engineering stress part but if there is a machine where we have designed all that extra equipment of infrared or laser beam and it keeps on hitting my sample as it keeps on changing the area and it keeps on recording the current value of the diameter then okay then we have no issue right so that is the only thing that it is very practically difficult and costly difficult and costly and of course in engineering we want to go for results which are economical that they are good results accurate results but they are economical so so that is the reason but right so this is the true stress the force is the same as in the engineering one but the area is the instantaneous or the current area rather than the original area now if you keep on changing the length then you see this is the integral definition dl upon l if you remove the integral it is delta l upon li delta l upon li the good thing is that if you if you know your integration 1 upon l dl 1 upon l dl then it is lin of that right so it is very simple and then because you will put the value of li upon l not right do you understand 1 upon x dx is lin of x 1 upon x dx is lin of x so 1 upon l dl is lin now in the lin you first put the value li and then put the value lo therefore the true strain is lin of li upon lo lin of li upon lo we are also saying that this is equal to lin of a not upon ai lin of a not upon ai so stop here for a minute stop here for a minute and think what is the reason don't read don't read further we are just saying that try to pause the lecture and in your mind give me a calculation or a reason why lin of li upon l not is the same as lin of a not upon ai lin of a not upon ai what do you think right so uh, we will we will come back to it again but now because it is the current area the current area in a tensile test is the current area more or the original area more yes you are right the area keeps on decreasing the length keeps on increasing the area keeps on decreasing so this value in the denominator is smaller than this value so which stress will be larger you see this is force divided by a large area this is same force divided by a small area so true stress will be larger so yes true stress is always greater than the engineering stress the true stress is always greater than the engineering stress right but engineering stress strain engineering not true is used in design and manufacturing why because even if we have engineering stress strain we can compare the materials no issue this is a stronger this is less strong this is very strong this is medium strong we can compare them and the calculation is much simpler because you are using the original area and original length so the machine is less costly the calculation is simpler so your calculation is simple your cost of doing the experiment is low and still comparing the materials you are still okay that this material is more strong this material is less strong therefore there is no issue so this is true stress and true strain versus engineering strain and engineering strain 